I have a text here. I can read it as a lecture, or I can speak. Uh, what would you prefer? OK. That's going to be on the website. So uh, that, for the record, is my official text. OK. Um, and it is titled, in order to put you all to sleep, um, China's Competing Ideological and Economic Policy Objectives in 2023. So let me speak to the text. Um, and uh, let's uh, finish a little early and then open it for a discussion, if that's OK with you, Linda. Excellent. I was uh, taken by Peter's early remarks about the uh, decline in the professional study of China in this country. For those of you who know a little about my own background on this, uh, 30 years ago when working for the Queensland government, I um, uh, authored a report entitled uh, The Teaching of Asian Languages in Australian Schools um, and Australia's Economic Future. Uh, it outlined a strategy which in those days we called NALSAS, the National Asian Languages and Studies Strategy for Australian Schools. Um, as the then Director General of the Cabinet Office in the Queensland Government, I then spent the better part of a year signing up Commonwealth and State Governments uh, as part of our federal compact to fund a decade-long strategy to take the then study of Chinese, Japanese, Korean and Indonesian from where it was in a parlour state 30 years ago to hopefully becoming something much better. We managed to do that, um, except with the change of government under the uh, Howard government, uh, the funding was withdrawn. Then, when there was a subsequent government um, after John Howard, uh, after 2007, we re-injected funding. Um, and regrettably, we saw the same pattern emerge. It is bad for our country. It is really bad for our country that we are not sufficiently systematic to understand that we need an entire cadre of people uh, across uh, this country of ours of 25 million who are f deeply familiar with the languages and cultures of our region, in particular uh, China and the study of Chinese language. The beginning of wisdom is to understand how others think and why they think that way. And for that, language is also a fundamental. The argument in this um, inaugural lecture that I seek to advance is an entirely analytical one. It goes to the question of the competing imperatives of uh, ideology under Xi Jinping and of resuscitating economic growth in the current period. And it is an analysis of where China is at these early months of 2023 and for the year ahead. It is not a lecture which deals with uh, the future of uh, US-China uh, policy or strategy, nor is it an analysis of uh, Australian government, uh, China policy and strategy. Um, it is purely analysis of China itself. And I do so uh, in my capacity still as the president uh, of the Asia Society in New York, uh, not as uh, a representative of the Australian government, uh, that does not begin until uh, the last week of March. So I am still a random free agent. <laughs> I wish to speak about uh, three sets of recent developments. The first is the 20th Party Congress, which was held only last October, which now seems an eternity ago. And second, what happened in this extraordinary several months since uh, the 20th Party Congress, where we have seen the summit between uh, President Biden uh, and President Xi Jinping uh, on the margins of the G20 held in uh, Bali in November. And then rolling the clock along, um, less than a month, the, the dramatic decision uh, in the beginning of the second week of December to abolish China's three-year-long policy of zero COVID. And as following that, a week later, a decision at the Central Economic Work Conference in the middle of December uh, to embark upon a new set of directions for the Chinese economy to restore economic growth. 
And the third thing I'll address tonight, um, which has barely made the commentary in this country, but should be analysed around the world, is Xi Jinping's quite remarkable speech to the Central Party School uh, on the uh, 8th of February uh, on his definition of China's own style of modernization, And what I'm seeking to trace through those three sets of developments are these competing tensions between China um, and its Marxist-Leninist leadership under Xi Jinping and the ideological parameters which he has laid out in recent years and reflected most acutely at the 20th Party Congress, and the practical and pragmatic uh, objective which all Chinese leaders face, which is sustain economic growth, not only in terms of its strategy to ensure that China becomes, in its own words, a Chiangwa, a strong country, a powerful country, um, but that also um, that this China sustains under the Communist Party its own perception of the social contract which it has with the Chinese people for increased growth, increased living standards, and continued and vibrant employment. Understanding the duality of these competing tensions is a core part of my own argument of understanding the dynamic of the contemporary China that we are dealing with in the world through its foreign policy and its security policy. So what we seek to do, and certainly the work I've done in the Asia Society and with the Center for China Analysis that we've established recently, uh, is to understand China from the inside out, often in its own terms, rather than seeking to simply re-engineer re that from the outside in. As I said at the beginning of my remarks about this country, the beginning of wisdom is to understand reality as perceived by others, and then to have that as a foundation for our own views, our own interests, and our own values, and how we seek to prosecute, therefore, our own interests within that medium. First, um, the 20th Party Congress. The 20th Party Congress uh, is the second Congress which uh, Xi Jinping has addressed as General Secretary of the Communist Party. He was appointed of the 18th Congress in the end of 2012. His first full Congress as General Secretary himself was five years later in 2017. And now this one, uh, the 20th Congress, just concluded at the end of last year. For those of you unfamiliar with the dynamics of Chinese Politburo politics, uh, this is the supreme decision-making body of the Chinese Communist Party. It's just celebrated its 100th anniversary in July the 1st last year, and party congresses are held every five years, more or less, and there have been 20 of them, 20 by five, even according to the Monday State Primary School, where I did my sums, equal to 100. So these are significant events, um, and they have their own deep interpretive value. And those of us in the China analytical business seek to look carefully at the text. Why do we do that? Why do we examine uh, each line, each sentence, and each phrase which is used in this report um, and compare it with the reports which have preceded it? Because that's the way the 95 million members of the Chinese Communist Party analyze the report themselves and the entire Chinese entrepreneurial class. Because in it, and the emphases contained within it, you see quite carefully the way in which uh, the sets of priorities uh, which the central Chinese leadership are outlining for the party and therefore through it, the country, for the next five years. So it is not just the arcane thing which uh, trained sinologists to do in order to amuse themselves late in the evening, although it does require several glasses of scotch, sometimes moving up to half a bottle, depending on the length of the speech. Uh, it is because it is the interpretive tool within the system and the beginning of wisdom is to understand how the system interprets itself. So what we have as an analytical unit in our centre in New York uh, done uh, over recent years is see two to three big changes emerge <clears throat> under Xi Jinping's leadership of the ideology of the Chinese Communist Party. You'll be familiar with the past, uh, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, over some decades now. Uh, going back to the time when Deng Xiaoping re-emerged as China's paramount leader at the third plenum of the 11th Central Committee at the end of 1978. 
But essentially, the defining characteristics of what we would call the Dung period uh, were summarized in the phrase that's Gai Ge Kai Fang, reform and opening. And that in itself became the leitmotif for a series of domestic market-oriented economic reforms which, and an economic opening to the outside world which enabled the Chinese economy to move from being a closed, state-controlled economy of marginal growth and, frankly, increasing poverty to the extraordinary economic achievements that we saw realized, particularly by the time we reached the 90s and the noughties and through to the decade just concluded. Average economic growth across that entire period from 78 uh, through until the beginning of the COVID period at 9.5% average annual economic growth, an unprecedented economic achievement uh, in any annals of economic history. And so that was the Deng Xiaoping formula, but there was a parallel formula as well. In order to accommodate and facilitate the centrality of economic growth and market principles in order to uh, facilitate that growth and to turn it into a reality, uh, Deng simultaneously pursued a foreign policy which accommodated those objectives. He sought to minimize differences with the outside world. He pursued a policy which he called hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead. And this became the guiding principle, in fact called within the system, Deng Xiaoping's diplomatic notes whereby the whole objective was to surrender the imperatives of Chinese foreign and security policy to this overarching imperative of sustained economic growth delivered by the domestic agenda of reform and opening. One complemented the other. Deng Xiaoping was an extraordinarily intelligent political and policy leader of the country. There was a third element to the Deng Xiaoping period we need to be familiar with as well. Remember, throughout this whole period, China is still governed by a Marxist-Leninist party. And so in order to reconcile these objectives, which is reform and opening at home and abroad for the economy, driven by market principles, and a foreign policy to accommodate it uh, through one which sought to integrate China with the international order in order to maximize the growth potential of the Chinese economy, Deng Xiaoping was no ideological slouch. Deng Xiaoping, uh, back in 1982, uh, at the 12th Party Congress, decided to redefine what Marxist-Leninists call as the central uh, contradiction, within uh, the overall guiding principles uh, of the Chinese Communist Party. Under Mao Zedong, the central contradiction that is, this dialectical concept driving Marxist-Leninist view of history through historical materialism and, um, and dialectical materialism, the central contradiction was defined in the Mao Zedong period as class struggle. You saw that manifest during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and essentially, this was Mao's um, understanding of the ideological imperative of the party from the time of about uh, 1956 uh, through until the conclusion of the Cultural Re Revolution 20 years later. Deng Xiaoping, recognizing that he was running a Marxist-Leninist party in order to accommodate ideologically the objectives which I've just described, that is reform and opening as far as the economy is concerned and an accommodating foreign policy in order to turbocharge the domestic growth objective, redefined this central ideological contradiction within the Marxist orthodoxy of the Chinese Communist Party as one which should instead not focus on class struggle or in Marxist parlance, the relations of production, but it should be instead one which enhanced first the factors of production, and that is growth. And that the central contradiction for the period was to unleash the factors of production so that later we could deal with the question of the of the relations of production or class once China had become wealthy. This may seem a torturous logic for us all sitting here in Bris Vegas, um, or sitting here in Australia, but it's a Marxist-Leninist party and it has its own dialect within it, and that dialect is the ideology of Marxism-Leninism. <laughs> 
And the reason I have spoken about that as being the underpinnings of what we uh, have seen in the period of Xi Jinping is to understand China as seen through the lens of Chinese Communist Party officials for the last 30 to 40 years. Xi Jinping, um, not initially, but at the 19th Party Congress in 2017, taking this ideological premise seriously that he had inherited from Deng and Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao and his predecessors, decided to change the central contradiction. Now, on the surface of it, if you look at the text, the 19th Party Congress report in 20, 2017, it does not look like a huge change. But if you look at it carefully, what it says is that the central contradiction of the Chinese Communist Party since 2017 has been to deal with the imbalances which have arisen as a consequence of this period of unqualified economic growth over the previous 35 years plus, going back to 1982 in fact, to the 12th Congress, between the 12th and the 17th, Cong uh, 12th and the 19th Congress. And you might say, well, what does that mean, dealing with the imbalances uh, which have arisen uh, from this 35-year period of unrestrained, sustained economic growth? If you deep, dig deeper into the text, what he meant in 2017 was we must now deal with the imbalances which have risen through radical income inequality within the country. And we must also deal with a new set of contradictions, and that is, as we all understand in the world at large, the contradictions between rapid economic growth and, and environmental sustainability. These are the imbalances uh, which the code language of a redefined Dun, central contradiction, uh, were to underpin and give guidance to the Communist Party uh, apparatchik class, the cadre class, in the period since 2017. So what did this mean in practical terms? In the period since 2017, what we have seen as a series of changes in China's central economic policy direction, consistent with this ideological change at the 19th Party Congress, which invited greater levels of party and state direct intervention into the market, which for the previous 35 years had been largely untrammeled. Not exclusively untrammeled, but largely untrammeled. And as a consequence of that, what you see is a series of interventions by the Chinese leadership uh, in the last five years aimed at doing the following things. One, <clears throat> ensuring that the gradual diminution of the role of state-owned enterprises was arrested and that the ever-increasing role of the private sector was checked. In fact, if you look at the data most recently produced by the Peterson Institute in, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., tracing the relative proportion of GDP represented by SOEs versus private uh, corporations in that period, you begin this um, uh, period with the private sector representing not more than 9% of production and it's SOEs representing something way in excess of 60 to 70%. And then by the time you reach um, about 2017, or a little before that, the lines cross. And so that by the time you reach about 2018, 2019, you have the private sector representing something like 60% of production and the state-owned sector representing something less than 30% uh, of production. It's worth looking at the study by the Peterson Institute. It's very recently reduced, uh, produced and released. But number one change you see from Xi Jinping's approach uh, to this um, changing um, a dynamic between uh, the state-owned sector and the private sector going back to his ideological reservation was to do this. He did not want to be simply a leader relying upon macroeconomic uh, control levers such as monetary policy and fiscal policy. He wanted industrial policy as a huge lever in his overall economic arsenal in order to engineer other objectives for the Chinese economy, including how to deal with the imbalances he described in the Party Congress back in 2017. So number one dynamic is this changing emphasis on the role of the private sector and the public sector. The Chinese have a phrase for this domestically, much disputed in Chinese politics, called guo jin min tui, uh, 
Guojin, that is the advance uh, of the state-owned sector, and Min Tui, means the retreat of the private sector. And this debate has been active, usually below the surface, in China's political economy these last five years. Another change that we saw in this period uh, was the uh, policy response to the overwhelming um, size and significance of what's called the Chinese tech platform economy, the tech sector. You'll be familiar with um, Alibaba, but Alibaba is simply one of a number of large tech firms. And the party's reservation that you began to see reflected towards this sector was this particular group of private enterprises had access to too much data beyond state control, uh, and that even within the, the remit of um, Chinese um, socialist uh, market economy uh, theory that they advance, that this sector was exercising too much market control as well. And there was a third critique. Not just data, which in the Chinese system is the province of the state, not the corporation, and certainly not in the European tradition, the individual. Not just the whole debate about monopoly and oligopoly and antitrust, but a third debate as well, which is purely about wealth and the massive accumulation of individual and corporate wealth by this particular sector, which for a Marxist-Leninist party began to represent an imbalance. And that um, brings us to the third big change which we saw emerging in this period. If I could categorize the first one as the reassertion of industrial policy led by the state-owned enterprise sector and some level of skepticism, therefore, about the private sector. Secondly, the particular uh, changes we saw in relation to the tech platforms and the tech economy, which have been the generator of such enormous activity, enterprise, and employment in the, in the uh, previous decades. But the third big change was what's called a common prosperity agenda. A, a new initiative by Xi Jinping to deal with his redefinition of the central ideological contradiction was imbalances from the previous period of unrestrained growth and unsustainable, in his view, ideologically, of income uh, inequality. And if you look at the history of the Gini coefficient in China and measured it and compared it with other countries, including even the United States, China had become one of the most unequal countries in both the developed and developing world. This presented a dilemma also from marxist leninist party. And so these three sets of changes you began to see work their way through the economic policy apparatus in the period 2017, 18, 19, and of course then you hit the road with, uh, hit the wall with COVID in 20. My point about these is that they all had a consequence. China's growth began to slow not just for the normal reasons of where China had reached in terms of its own advance across the development curve, with per capita income lying at about 11,000 US, and therefore a slowing in, let's call it double-digit growth, back to a more moderate uh, level of growth, would normally associated with lower middle-income economies, determined, though, from its policy leadership to avoid the so-called middle-income trap and the associated arcane debates which lie within that field, which I won't touch on particularly in the presence of Martin Parkinson. But beyond that, what he was um, saying uh, was that this level of income inequality was unsustainable. So the combined impact of these policy measures was to slow growth. And growth did slow. And this was before the impact of zero COVID in 2020. And when zero COVID hit, China's growth rate, like those, the growth rates of the rest of the world, uh, hit uh, the wall, uh, collapsed to near zero. Growth in 2020, I think, came in at 2.3%. Um, 2021, a bounce back uh, of something like um, 7 or 8%, but against a very low base. But then we hit, of course, 2022. And uh, this was another bad growth year. But my thesis to you is not just because of zero COVID, it was accompanied by the wash through effect of these underlying changes in central economic policy, which in turn had emanated from the ideological changes which were reflected back at the 19th Party Congress in 2017.
So when we reach, therefore, the decision taken uh, on the uh, 7th of December this year, last year, to abandon zero COVID dramatically, overnight, um, a driving force was, of course, uh, the emergence of the public protest movement across China, the so-called white card protest movement. This caught, in my judgment, the party by complete surprise. These were spontaneous protests across the country. No central organising hand. These were people who were deeply concerned about the impact of three years of zero COVID uh, with a compounding effect on the growth rates within the economy. That was one factor. But the second was when you began to look at the numbers emerging in the fourth quarter, 2022, as the party had access to by the first and second weeks of December 2022, all the drivers of economic growth were falling through the floor. It was turning into be a catastrophic economic growth year. In the first three quarters of the year, the party said that average growth had reached 2.8. But if you look at what was emerging in the fourth quarter, you looked at the prospect of growth actually being in negative territory for the entire year. And so as a consequence of uh, these factors, the party not only decided on the 7th or 8th of December, depending on what time zone you're in around the world, uh, to uh, change zero COVID like that, the more significant set of changes were those a week later at the Central Economic Work Conference. The annual event, which defines the economic policy priorities for the party and the country for the year, year ahead. And if you look carefully at the text of that report, published on the 15th of December last year, not that long ago, it identifies what I have um, outlined in this uh, turgid text, which I commend you to look at tonight with at least a glass of scotch, if you're suffering from insomnia. Um, it identifies 10 areas of policy correction from where the party had been for the previous five years. Subtle in some cases, more overt in others. But dealing with these thematics of uh, the role of the tech platforms, dealing with the thematics of the role of the private sector, and dealing with thematics of the common prosperity agenda, which as a term, Gung Tong Fu Yu, disappears from the text altogether. And remember, the party and its membership 95 million and the country at large analyze these texts forensically, and so should we. They're our tools for understanding. It's not as if, however, Deng Xiaob, uh, Xi Jinping was thinking to turn the clock back prior to 2017. It was not that. There was a, what I describe as a series of policy corrections aimed at sending positive signals back to the market that they would have greater economic and market opportunities than before. But there are also continuities. Continuities from what happened after 2017 as well. A continued assertion of the centrality of industrial policy, a continued assertion of uh, an approach to the international economy which saw the principal drivers of growth in the future as lying as in domestic demand and not in simply in net exports. But more importantly, a continued reassertion of the orthodoxy of national economic sufficiency is partly a product of industrial policy, but also mindful of China's own perception of its emerging and difficult global geopolitical circumstances. So my argument coming out of this most recent set of changes announced in the middle of uh, December was you had a series of mixed messages. Remember the underpinning argument of 2017 uh, the 19th Party Congress, we are moving towards a more Marxist socialist set of policy settings, the private sector responding accordingly. Secondly, growth slows compounded by what happened with zero COVID for three years. We then, in the middle of December, seek to correct course, but we're not prepared to correct course to the extent that we are going to eliminate the ideological conclusions we reached back in 2017. If you are sitting in China today as a corporate leader or as a political leader, a provincial governor or a municipal mayor, you are dealing with these two sets of messages. A message of continued ideological continuity and the centrality of the party and the state and therefore the instruments of it through industrial policy, etc. And at the same time, you see a series of other messages, 
what I would describe as micro messages to the private sector saying we're going to be more accommodating than we have been in the previous five years. As our times advance, let me conclude uh, on this, because that is what unfolded uh, most recently uh, in the uh, Central Economic Work Conference of mid-December. I said I'd also touch on a speech literally a week ago delivered by Xi Jinping to the party school. It's a fascinating speech. For those of you who are nerds, and of course I am not one, the, um, then I would commend it to you uh, in translation, because the English language translations actually do proper service to the Chinese original, and I've had a look at both. Uh, it is Xi Jinping's ideological definition uh, of what he defines as Zhongguo Shi, the Xiandai Hua, Chinese style modernization. And for those who assumed in terms of these pragmatic policy shifts I've just described from the middle of uh, December at the Central Economic Work Conference that ideology had now been dispensed, no, this was a further reassertion of ideological orthodoxy. In other words, the left hand saying to the right hand, don't think this is simply a return to market gangbusters and the rest. And so the text is fascinating because uh, Xi Jinping says in the text, Chinese-style modernization uh, proves, ultimately, that you cannot equate modernization with the West. It's an unequivocal ideological statement. In fact, he goes on to say uh, that uh, the time has come for the Communist Party to demonstrate the myth of that equation, and that, in fact, Chinese-style modernization, um, its mission, in part, is to disprove uh, the ultimate efficiency of democratic capitalism. My phrase in part, but a legitimate interpretation of what is found in the original text. And that China is therefore charting a different course ideologically. And furthermore, what Xi Jinping says in the text is, this model provides now a valid alternative for developing countries around the world. He hinted at this at the 19th Party Congress with the single phrase, that China's development model, fa zhang mo shi, would be available for others to look at. But if you look at the text of what emerged a week ago at this address to the Central Party School, it's a much more full-hearted statement that this now represents an entirely valid alternative ideological frame and theoretical frame for the political economy in the developing world than you've been sold as an idea from the United States, from the IMF, from the World Bank and everybody else during the period of the so-called Washington Consensus. So in sum, and to conclude, that is Xi Jinping throwing down the ideological gauntlet. To conclude, and why I have entitled this uh, uh, oration this evening, the uh, competing tensions of ideological orthodoxy and the pragmatic challenge of restoring economic growth is because that is it. That is the central dilemma within contemporary Chinese political economy today. A Marxist-Leninist party seeking to continue to assert its ideological orthodoxy through a more Leninist party, a more Marxist control of, over the economy, while at the same time recognizing that in so doing, that they are in danger of producing a growth outcome which not only compromises their long-standing social contract with the Chinese people of rising living standards, rising incomes, and rising employment, but also possibly compromising the grand national objective of the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, which has as its objective for China to emerge once again as the preeminent regional and global power, not least in terms of the size of its economy. Goldman Sachs produced a report back in 2011 predicting that China's GDP at market exchange rates would surpass that of the United States in or around 2025. Goldman Sachs has just produced a revised report putting that back to something in the order of 2035, 2036. This ultimately hinges on the growth rate, which in turn is shaped by central economic policy direction, which is in turn shaped by the competing tensions of Marxist-Leninist ideology. I thank you. <laughs>
Well, thank you. That was a remarkable tour de force. Uh, amazingly insightful um, assessment of the state of Chinese economic politics today. My kids wouldn't agree that it was interesting, so. <laughs> well, I did. <laughs> I'm gonna just immediately bring up um, the speech that Xi Jinping uh, gave a week ago. And I do agree that please do read the written text of the China Matters Oration by Dr. Kevin Rudd, because um, it's, it's really a very in-depth document, uh, which one can't verbally go through in 40 minutes. Um, just going back to Xi Jinping's decision to so staunchly say that modernization is not westernization. I mean, for years, China has really tried to fend off any kind of insinuation um, that China would be trying to export its development model. Um, it's wanted to make it very clear that it's not pushing its model on anyone else. Um, this was a rare um, statement of superiority. And as you said, I think it, it was really staking the ground. Do you sense that China will work more on this and will in many countries around the world where uh, China is viewed so differently than in the United States, Australia, and Europe, um, will it start really actively promoting that development model, helping countries pursue the superior Chinese development model? I think that it depends on two things. <clears throat> One is the resolution of, let's call it, the internal dialectic within the Chinese Communist Party, mm -hmm. which is how much do I flap this wing, the ideological wing, and how much do I flap this wing, the pragmatic market-based economic uh, policy wing. What Xi Jinping is saying, I believe, in his speech at the Central Party School is that this will be a continuing set of tensions within our system domestically. The problem for Xi Jinping in so doing is that it also sends mixed messages to Chinese entrepreneurs. Mm. It sends mixed messages to Chinese municipal and provincial governors and those responsible for making decisions with entrepreneurs and um, beyond that with uh, those arriving from abroad through foreign direct investment. And so what I've written earlier in uh, policy papers for the um, Center for China Analysis at our institute in New York is through these mixed messages, we are likely to see for the period ahead China muddling through in terms of its real world growth performance. We will see a recovery in Chinese growth this year. Domestic consumption is going to come back somewhat. There'll be some restoration of activity in the tech sector. There'll be some restoration activity even in the property sector. Uh, there'll be um, obviously some continued growth delivered by net exports, depending on the state of the global economy and the outcome of current directions in global monetary policy and the health of the global economy this year. So the reason I say that is the future articulation of this model abroad will be shaped in part by its successful conclusion or otherwise at home. That's why we pay a lot of attention to what signals are being sent out domestically. China's growth coming out of this year, most market and public economists are predicting a growth performance of the Chinese economy somewhere between 4.7 and 5.3 for calendar year 2023. Most market economists and public economists are agnostic about what happens beyond for the underpinning logic that I've described in terms of this unresolved set of tensions. On the external front, what we note analytically is this change in the narrative. A, as you correctly said, Linda, once China saying it was not faintly interested in exporting its development model, two, Xi Jinping of the 19th Party Congress dipping his toe in the water and saying, maybe, and then a week ago saying, maybe a lot. <laughs> we simply note the textual change, and what I know of the Chinese system is the textual change is not accidental. It's not just, oh, I'm having a press conference and I misspoke, what happens in our system. Um, <laughs> the, uh, well, of course I never misspoke, but uh, I misspoke a lot. But uh, it doesn't happen in the Chinese communist system. 
These things are weighed upon and deliberated upon, and the writing group, which, which ultimately puts the text together for the central leadership, reaches these conclusions carefully, bringing together these different tensions. So, there is an ideological and political resolve to put to the world, the developing world, the global south, mm -hmm. an alternative policy narrative, which others at previous times have loosely called the Beijing Consensus. Um, you can see that happening. What is less clear is the extent to which that model domestically will continue to succeed because the growth numbers at present are suboptimal. Okay, I'm going to um, pick you up on this mixed messages and muddling through and jump to um, foreign policy and a very important relationship, which is China's relationship with Russia. As a European, I've watched um, the mood in Europe sour towards China, not because um, of human rights abuses, which have been there always and have been a thorn in the side of EU-China policy and Europeans' perceptions of China, but it's very much China's refusal to condemn the invasion by Russia of Ukraine. And it's quite obvious that China is very uncomfortable um, with the situation it is in. Uh, mixed messages, obviously we've seen a lot of them coming out of Beijing vis-a-vis um, -vis Moscow. Do you feel that Xi Jinping will find a way out um, of this uncomfortable dilemma that he's found himself in um, as long as Putin is in power? Chinese statecraft, in my own analysis, when it looks at its relationship with states, is driven by an underlying statist logic, which is when it looks at the Russian Federation, it sees A, this neighbour, mm. B, one with whom for the last 400 years it's largely had a problematic relationship. Hostile, uh, even. Um, uh, in massive territorial disputes over many decades and in some cases centuries. And the alternative script, which we've seen slowly emerge, as you know, since uh, 1989, when Gorbachev and Deng resolved the border, finally. Uh, and then furthermore, under Xi Jinping, uh, in a series of increasingly intimate bilateral engagements between 2012 and 2022, obviously, which the world did not focus on. Uh, and then the one they did focus on was the meeting of 4 February last year. Uh, just on 12 months ago, when the Chinese side uh, announced that this would now be a strategic partnership without limits. And so the evolution here, uh, based on state logic, was, in my judgment, one, from Beijing's perspective, always preferable to have a benign relationship with such a, an enormous neighbour. Two, far better to have that benign relationship which enables you to concentrate all your resources on the principal strategic competition which is with the United States in the maritime domain. Three, from China's logic, to see Russia as a source of reliable, uh, discounted commodities, be they agricultural or commodity-based. And four, through continued policy uh, collaboration through institutions such as the UN Security Council, to represent a continued challenge to US interests in the region and the world. And you can, if you observe closely the degree of coordination in New York between the two delegations, they invariably vote together. Yes. Not 100% of the time, but 95% of the time. And so you've got all of that on one side of the ledger, Linda, and then on the other side of the ledger, there is this thing called keeping Europe happy. Um, now, from the Chinese statecraft point of view, their judgment is that argument A is of more importance than argument B, notwithstanding Ukraine. Um, the foreign policy system in China, in my observation, uh, has a range of views on this. Mm. Um, and the uh, fact that Vladimir Putin did what he did, the fact in Ukraine, the fact that this war is now a year old, the fact that it, uh, at best it is in stalemate and with uh, the up upcoming Russian offensive yet to be determined in terms of its military success, uh, and the fact that you've just pointed to, which is every capital in Western Europe at least, and NATO membership capitals, has reflected its deep concerns about not just China's silence on the condemnation of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but beyond that, 
uh, China's um, continued strong economic relationship uh, with, uh, with Russia during this whole period as well, and certainly not embracing the unilateral sanctions formula em uh, embraced by the United States and its allies. The level of discomfort in the Chinese foreign policy is establishment is reflected by the fact that the principal foreign policy official responsible for this, or deemed to be responsible for the Strategic Partnership Without Limits document of uh, 4 February last year, uh, uh, is no longer in position. Um, in the Chinese system, the leader never makes mistakes, officials make mistakes. Um, and, uh, and as a consequence, he is no longer occupying that position. Where will it go? Mm. Uh, for the year ahead. Um, I do not have that crystal ball, but I do have a deep understanding that China will always preference these underlying state interests as they see it most acutely defined in terms of the proximity of its neighbours and regard the European interest in terms of solidarity with Ukraine as a secondary interest. You will see some diplomatic formulations which try to straddle those two realities but if you ask for the baseline view, I think it is that. Despite the fact that China is going to suffer um, from less trade and investment from Europe. Um, so I was thinking more of their uh, emphasis on doubling down on getting the economy going. But I'm going to just bring up one more theme and then I'll be opening They'd up like the to, floor. but my overall argument is if it is a naked choice, the choice will be the Russian interest. Yes. Um, I agree with you. I agree with you. And I don't think we're going to see I think see a that is clear from the documentary evidence. Um, I'm going to turn to Australia. Very aware that you're not keen to talk about the day-to-day -day politics of the bilateral relations just now with your new role about to begin, as you and I agreed. Not only not keen, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as you know, I've argued through this difficult period, frosty period of bilateral relations over the past few years that it is in my view, in Australia's national interest to have, quote unquote, a constructive relationship, or I've said at least a working relationship with Beijing. Um, the current government talks about stabilizing the relationship. Um, but looking ahead, for example, two to three years down the road, and taking into account this ever intensifying strategic competition between Washington and Beijing, at its best, what could the Australia-China relationship look like, in your view? I said I wouldn't comment. So, um, what I, the term stabilizing, winding xing, uh, is a phrase used in Beijing as well. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about Australia, it's a phrase also used about the stabilizing of the US-China relationship, balloons notwithstanding. And so if you look at the surrounding language uh, which has emerged uh, coming out of the Bali summit uh, between Xi Jinping and uh, Joe Biden in November, much of that language was about stabilizing uh, the US-China relationship. And the underpinning strategic logic that I have seen on both sides there is a desire to take the temperature down mm. from where it had reached by the end of last year. Uh, after many years of structural deterioration. Uh, Xi Jinping's language in the um, uh, Bali readout, if you look carefully at the very long Chinese readout, uncustomarily long, coming out of Bali, it took to, uh, talked about the need to put a um, security safety net under the relationship, an Anquan Wang. It talked about the need to put protections into the relationship, new Feng Yu new protections. And this is new language. This is not being used by the Chinese side before. And there's parallel language, if you like, on the American side about needing to manage the strategic competition between China and the United States uh, and to construct what the Americans describe and what many of us have been describing for some time as strategic guardrails into the relationship. This was where it was headed, leading to the proposed um, Blinken visit to um, Beijing as of... Um, as of uh, the week just passed um, until uh, the balloon. But interestingly, leaving the balloon to one side, um, uh, the reports uh, that I've seen last 24 hours indicate that it's probable uh, 
that Blinken and Wang Yi will meet at the margins of the Munich Security Conference to be held this weekend in Munich. So what do I deduce from that, and what do analysts deduce from that? That notwithstanding the dynamics of the balloon, and whether or not this meeting in Munich proceeds or not, or what its outcome might be, the bottom line is that there is a predisposition still in Beijing and Washington to take the temperature down. Why? Because in my own judgment, and I'm speaking as an analyst, not representing any government, is that the judgment in both capitals is it is better to reduce the risk of crisis, conflict and war by accident at a time when neither country wants that. That is now. So the reason I say that in response to your question about Australia is that that is the strategic framework within which we're operating. Bilaterally, um, both Prime Minister Albanese, Foreign Minister Wong, Deputy Prime Minister Miles have been quite clear about the objective of stabilising the Australia-China relationship at the same time. What you can observe uh, is the resumption of ministerial contact. Um, that is the function or an expression of a more normal relationship. Uh, what we still do not have is a normalisation of the trade relationship because of the um, range of import restrictions which China unilaterally placed on Australian goods in response to actions or statements made by the previous Australian government. So that matter is still to be resolved. Um, and more broadly, uh, there is still much work to be done now that China is coming out of its zero COVID period. Uh, to resume what I would describe as much more normal levels of people-to-people -people contact and students arriving back in this country as well. My crystal ball's not good enough, uh, Linda, for three years' time on the bilaterals, uh, but what I observe right now, given where we've been for, frankly, the last three to five years, is a predisposition both capitals to seek to stabilise. Um, and I still see that uh, predisposition both in Washington and Beijing as well. Much, of course, can occur which uh, uh, destabilises the relationship, but the political predisposition is the one I've just described. Yes, I would agree. Thank you.